Everyone's had kind of multiple director credits and multiple things, and these things are always a, a team effort. Uh, so, but it's great that you're here to represent the film. Uh, and yeah, this was a, um, a very fascinating glimpse, a character portrait of, of Grant and uh, of their community and the people that um, that are supporting everybody else. And it was so great to see that. Uh, how did you meet Grant, and what was your relationship? And have you learned kickboxing as a result of this film? It's funny that you asked that as part of the question because I found Grant originally through Instagram because they were promoting Queer Kickboxing Club, Queer Kickboxing Club Chicago. And I thought, maybe if I get some free time in my class schedule, I'll sign up for a kickboxing course. So that was my original introduction to Grant. But then when we were in the documentary course, I had not yet contacted Grant or signed up for any kickboxing sessions. And I realized I would be way more interested in showing up with a camera than being the kickboxing student to film someone else learn kickboxing and to interact with Grant. So we reached out to Grant through um, their website, and they were really interested in participating in the documentary, and it went from there. And Jack, how did it work together? Because as I say, it's a team, and did you divide all of the duties to be got to, you know, because obviously editing is crucial in a film like this. Yeah, I would say that we all kind of naturally approach it well, and off, I found that the really what came what it came down to was just active communication it's okay if i need to give the hard drive to henry to do some editing quickly like let's do that pass it over to aaron who couldn't be here but was our third co-director editor and everything else involved in the production of kick um i it, like ever since i like was able to go and like see grant's like teaching i was like mm, i've been like thinking about it in the back of my head is like no, this is really, really a cool experience to just be a part of, like, watching him work, essentially, was incredibly impressive, and just how well he's able to teach. Um, and so, I don't know, maybe kickboxing in the future, but uh, I, like I said, it was all really just communication and just talking as much as possible, even if we annoyed each other to death, because oh, can we move this two seconds to the left or so for so on and so forth, just to make sure that it was the best product as it could be. And I thought it was fascinating that as well as the kickboxing, we also see Grant's uh, day job in the coffee shop. And I think it's kind of a shame that, that they can't make a living from teaching kickboxing. And is that something that they would like to do, do you think? Um, very much so. Actually, Grant uh, runs not just Queer Kickboxing Club Chicago, but runs uh, Queer Karaoke Club Chicago and helps organize um, kind of like pop-up events that he calls Self-Care Sundays, um, which is just like a bunch of local vendors of various different services and kind of like there was, uh, when I went to film that, like there was a bunch of stuff that we shot that didn't make it into the final cut, but I think that was... Uh, there was a massage person, there was somebody doing tarot, there were a, 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 like a hair cutter, a bunch of different uh, vendors just to kind of build this community. So I really think that what Grant wants is for his job to be building as much community as possible, and QKC was just only a part of that. But absolutely, uh, everything I know about Grant says that they would love to do it full time. And I'll add to that, Grant is also a fashion model, and Grant was, at the time of us shooting the film, being interviewed by a dating competition um, to see if they wanted to go on, so they're very busy. And the last updates from Grant and QKC is that QKC is now hosting a monthly training session at a regular gym, so Grant's been able to nail down, down that training space. And as was shown at the end of our film, Grant hopes to one day host a gender-neutral kickboxing tournament, and they said maybe that's something for them in the next five years they would be hoping to make a reality. We wish them all the best. Um, it must be wonderful to have 36 hours in a day. <laughs> we, we need another secret of this, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm now thinking of like karaoke, kickboxing, can connect, uh, like doing the same in the same event. I think that would really help people to sing better if they're kicking. <laughs> uh, yeah, terrific. Please stay with us on stage because we're now going to bring uh, the next filmmaker up, which is uh, Sriman Narayanan from Reckoning. Sriman. We recognize you from the film. You're very front and center in the film. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to ask you about. Obviously, we have the great tradition of Michael Moore and Grant Spurlock and Nick Broomfield and people who put themselves front and center. Uh, at what point did you realize that you were going to be prominent in this film as part of the group of people? Um, I don't know at what point necessarily. I remember pitching this documentary with, with me taking a very back behind the camera role originally and then 
uh, conversations with Professor Huffman, um, he, he brought it up. He said, I, I think you, you should be more present in, in the presentation of this film, and um, at least in the way that I was talking it through to um, the course that we were, the rest of the students in the course that we were working through, and then also to Professor Huffman. It was, uh, it, it seemed clear that, that I had like a, a passion for this and, and that um, it was a bit of a complicated issue and uh, it might have helped to have someone, you know, guiding, so uh, like a, a very forward-facing uh, person guiding the, the story. So I think uh, from a foreign perspective, that, that's where it, it showed up and it was pretty early on. I think it's always good in filmmaking to use the assets that you have, and obviously you're an asset because of your, uh, how to put this uh, comfortableness in camera, let's put it like that. You know, I didn't feel that way originally, but I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> the, the modesty. We got the um, signal that we've got five minutes, so this is not me being unequal, but just to say that we're going to bring the next person on, which is Vanessa Kelson from Everything is Fine. Vanessa. There will be a chance in the lobby for you to speak more casually, but I think it's important to have everybody up here and so we can see your faces and salute you and your achievement uh, and everything is fine. I mean, this was kind of, this could have been like a six part mini series about the incredible history of uh, the black communities in, in Evanston. Uh, I mean, I don't know where to begin with this. I've got, I've got like 30 seconds to ask you about it. What was your, you know, the, the, the entry point into this community? What, what, what was the start, the, the, who opened the door for you? Yeah, I think Dino Robinson that you saw was the historian. I had talked with him over the many years, I guess, of my undergraduate degree at Northwestern. And um, the city of Evanston actually made their own short documentary uh, about 10 years ago about the two YMCA's. They kind of don't include the back half. It's just, um, <laughs> oh, there was this really great place, and, and now we have one YMCA. <laughs> and I had some questions, and that sort of inspired me to look a little bit further. And I started just messaging with Dino Robinson, and he was very willing to share that history. And I was like, there's, there's a really big story here that, that didn't really, really wasn't expanded on by the city, and I wonder why. Um, and so that's, that was sort of the entryway, and uh, he was a great um, mentor and connector to the rest of the really vibrant black community that still lives in Evanston to this day. And I think it was great the way that you were able to give so much uh, balance to the amazing personalities, Dolores and uh, Logan, the police chief, and these people who really, you know, that their personalities emerged from the film, I mean that was been so, well, that you felt like a duty, uh, you know, it was a responsibility, a heavy responsibility for you in making this film. I mean, I don't think it was a responsibility at all. They did that all by themselves. They are just such incredible people, and I feel lucky that I got to share a room with them and just get to hear their stories. I think especially they've lived just incredible lives, and that was a really big reason why at the very end of the film we have a sort of summary of just some. Of the highlights of these incredible accomplishments of amazing people. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting you frame it in that way because I never thought of it in that way before. It was just an opportunity more than a responsibility. And of course, Mayor Bish, who was uh, a very <laughs> strange presence, but there we are. Thank you, Vanessa. And finally, as I say, last but not least, please welcome Ankita Kumar from the last one we saw. Welcome Uh, and again, congratulations to you, Ankita, for uh, sensitive treatment of an incredibly complex and ongoing difficult problem, uh, difficult situation, and the sympathy that you showed, the empathy that you showed was really the thing that um, uh, buoyed the film. Again, it's the classic question in documentary, at what point did you say, I have to stop now, because there is, this story is an ongoing story? Um, I don't think we should ever stop talking about this topic, because... Uh, my grandparents were refugees to India, um, and when the CA happened in 2019, I realized that you know um, they were integrated into the country because they were of a certain faith, and there were a lot of friends of my grandparents who were of a different faith, and there were many people who came to India in 1971 after the Bangladesh war, um, and they would lose nationality, they would be declared foreigners in their own country and I think we still continue to grapple with this. The Indian government announced right before we have a national election coming up announced that we will be implementing the CAA. That means we will go ahead with whatever was discussed in the documentary. So um, 
I don't think we should stop and I don't think I'm going to stop and um, I think this might be one of the last documentaries criticizing the Modi government uh, because Modi is cracking down on journalists and uh, free speech um, and most of the media houses have been bought by corporates uh, close to Modi uh, but hopefully um, we will continue to um, you know raise our voices and make another film on this topic so that we can raise more awareness but yeah I don't think there's any point where I thought we'd stop I think we'll keep, keep doing what we're doing. And obviously having the backing of Northwestern and the Medill School gives you an international perspective and that in a way makes it kind of, not easier is the wrong word, but you have the possibility to tell that story to an international audience, which as you say, if, the, if the, internally it's being closed down, you, you, are you still living in, you're living in India or in the US? I live in the US, I keep going to India. Now I don't know when, when we obviously have an Indian version of the film, we will be editing out certain things, we'll be getting rid of some of the parts um, of, of the bill when you mentioned the CAA so we will be we are going to be aware of that because I have an Indian passport and I need to go back to my parents still live there so I don't want to be in a situation where I land and I'm just going to stay simply detained because I'm already a subject of trolling on social media so I don't think I want to attract more uh, attention from the government but that said um, I feel that um, there is um, the fact that I'm here gave me an opportunity to make this film and my professor Huffman you know, encouraged me to move to video because I never worked on video before. And now that I've worked on video, I've realized it ha has such a massive impact. And it was very difficult to shoot with these subjects because most of the time we actually were shooting with somebody else. We landed in India, that subject refused to shoot with us on the day of the shoot. We found Samira the, the next day and we shot with her. It was incredibly difficult. We had a lawyer who came on camera and then said, I don't want to be part of this film because it's politically charged and the government might close down my office. Uh, I have had to you know, take very hard decisions and um, this film had a lot of footages that we couldn't use because people were just backing out left, right and center. And last year there came a point where I just had a mental breakdown and I thought I can't finish this film because it's just so hard, you know, like people are backing out and people are saying they don't want to do this. But seeing it here, I, that the, that we came this far is only because we had, you know, people like uh, you know, Professor Huffman backing us and believing in us. Even when, you know, I turned out and said, I don't think we can do this, but we did it. So hopefully we will keep doing it. <laughs> Congratulations. Please join me in saluting the filmmakers. And the conversation can continue outside the cinema and yes. please do take your trash with you because we're doing a quick turnaround. Thank you to all the filmmakers and to Professor Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you.